persistent prayer, and relentless resistance. I think if you take it all together, it can add up to a stubborn hope. Hope against hope. Hope against all evidence to the contrary that justice, that God's justice, will prevail. We hope and we pray together with the prophet Amos and the widow in this parable that justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. With the widow and with those in Israel and Palestine, we are called to engage in persistent prayer and relentless resistance to the powers and structures of injustice. And there has been a long and turbulent history of injustice in this region of the world. I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. It's a land that is called holy to the three major religions of the world. And just like any children, we children of God, we don't share space very well. And so this morning, let us lift our prayers of petition, our prayers of lament, our prayers of supplication unto the Lord of all creation, trusting that they will be heard, trusting that God cares, trusting in the promise that God is indeed with us and with all people, always. And even so... I wonder, I wonder if you have ever prayed with passion, with persistence, only to be met with what seems like silence, what might seem to be a silent refusal of the cares of your heart. I wonder if this is what the Israeli and Palestinian people might be feeling now. Where are you, God? How long must this conflict continue? How long will this iteration of the same war last? Friends, there is blame and guilt enough to go around. Where is God's mercy? Where is God's justice? When? When will justice and peace kiss, as the psalmist assures us they one day will? Is peace even possible anymore? So we wonder sometimes, where is God? Does God care? Most of us, I think, have wrestled with these questions at one time or another in the course of our lives, in the gripping grief of death, or the devastation of divorce, or the despair of a recent diagnosis or the jarring jolt of joblessness. We've cried out to God in lament, in des desperation, and maybe even in despair. And I imagine there's a lot of this happening in the Middle East right now and all over the world, in Ukraine, in Africa, many, many places. Prayers persist. And some may even find it within themselves to pray without ceasing as a protest of the earthly experience of silence or violence, of absence, of pervasive injustice pressing in from all sides. We know, we know somewhere deep down, we know that God's steadfast love really does endure forever. So how does this all add up and how can we make sense of the conflict between what we know of God and our very real experiences of feeling forsaken? What does Jesus tell us? Well, when we read the parables of Jesus, we, we often tend to allegorize them. We search for a character to represent God and other characters who represent humanity. But as this particular parable points out so well, 
A more helpful way to read the parables of Jesus, I think, is to ask the question, in what way is this character like God? And in what way might this character be unlike God? It doesn't have to be all or none, you see. We can hold two truths together like we need to right now with our world. And so while we may be tempted to equate a judge in a story with the judgment of God, the unjust judge in this parable that we just read is really not like God at all. In fact, he may even be the antithesis of our good and gracious God. The judge here is ruthless by any human standard. And especially in light of Jewish law and custom, this judge neither feared God nor respected people. Now, according to Jewish law and custom, the fear of the Lord, awe and reverence for God and respect for what is righteous in God's eyes, that served as the basis, the foundation for rendering a wise judgment. You see, a judge who didn't fear God simply couldn't be just in his judgments. This is found all throughout the Hebrew scriptures. It's in the Torah, it's in the history books, it's in the prophets. Fear the Lord, judge fairly. Do not oppress the widow. This is the background, the background for this parable that Jesus told. God knew that there would be disputes and conflict among God's people, and so God set up a way to address them fairly and with compassion. God knew that the vulnerable of society would be easily oppressed and taken advantage of, and so God spelled out very clearly not to oppress the widows and the orphans, the foreigners, or the poor. In fact, elsewhere in Scripture, it is written, an ideal judge is righteous. He will not show partiality. He will listen. He will listen to the one who was wronged. And he will not ignore the supplications of the widow. But in this parable, that's exactly what happens. The judge ignores the pleas of the widow repeatedly. And yet, this widow is our example, an example of strength. She is the model of persistent prayer and crying out against injustice, relentlessly resisting the forces of evil. She doesn't give up. She doesn't lose heart. She keeps coming back persisting in her supplication, persisting in her pursuit of justice. Now this parable addresses systemic and structural injustice and abuse of power. As a widow, this woman is vulnerable. In fact, a widow was the quintessential image of helplessness in the ancient world, one who was easily taken advantage of by the powerful. Now, thankfully, that is no longer true today, as I have the wonderful um, experience of bearing witness to with, with so many widows that I encounter. But this woman, this widow, she was treated poorly and victimized more than once. There's the original offense, which is the basis of her coming repeatedly to the judge. And then on top of that, she has ignored and denied her rights as a widow by the very person to whom she turned for help. She rightly resisted and she rightly persisted. She knows that God's law is on her side. Resistance against injustice, persistent prayer in the face of seeming silence. An unjust judge with not only no regard for, but even contempt for people. 
Maybe not all people, but certain types of people, certain categories of people. And history bears this out, friends, with, as we all know, far, far too many tragic examples of prejudice, intolerance, oppression, and even ethnic cleansing. The Middle East is no stranger to this type of injustice, both past and present. Both anti-Semitism and anti-Arab or anti-Muslim sentiments run rampant all throughout our world. And in this most recent century, in the last century, what, what silence could be louder than that surrounding the Holocaust? What prayer could be more persistent than that of six million Jews? Several years ago now, I had the opportunity to hear the story of a Holocaust survivor when I attended an event called We Remember. It was a community-wide commemoration held at Temple Emmanuel. And its intent was actually to explore the renewal, the renewal and new life that can follow suffering, the hope the hope that can sometimes emerge from tragedy. This event featured Stephen Paulus's work called To Be Certain of the Dawn, which is a Holocaust memorial oratorio that was commissioned in honor of the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the Nazi death camps. The composer was there, and he spoke eloquently of the process of composing this piece. He spoke of incorporating the poignant, almost haunting sound of the shofar, an instrument, a ram's horn, actually, used in worship at Jewish synagogues, particularly on the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. He also spoke of the use of both Jewish prayers and Christian prayers incorporated into this musical piece, the juxtaposition of the Jewish Shema, their most foundational prayer, with the Christian prayer, holy, holy, holy. And prayers of lament, beautifully written, such as, how should we think ourselves to be your hands, your feet, how should we be your heart? How did we think that we might be recognized as you in all we failed to do? This compelling oratorio represents musically our complicity in the structures of injustice. Its intent was to heighten understanding and awareness while also at the same time conveying a message of hope and forgiveness. Now, in addition to hearing the composer speak, a woman who had survived the Holocaust also spoke and told her story of fear and suffering, of tragedy and death, of crying out to God. Having been taken in for safety by a Christian family. She said that she cried out to God in both the language of her Jewish faith and also the language of our Christian faith. Hers, like so many others, was a story of persistent prayer, persistent prayer in the face of seeming silence and relentless resistance against the forces of injustice. Her story was also one of hope. She survived. She survived amidst horrible conditions and extremely unfavorable odds. And she was actually then reunited with her twin brother in 1995, 50 years apart, never knowing if the other had survived. Quite amazing. Friends, we say never again. We say never again, but look what is happening now. 
Consider what's been happening in Israel and Palestine since the end of World War II. Near constant conflict, repeated outbreaks of violence, building walls, annexing land, oppressing neighbors. Deep pain, deep pain runs throughout this region like an ever-present river. And, surprisingly, even miraculously, hope blooms there too, like an oasis in the desert. And I was able to bear witness to both when I traveled to Israel and Palestine with a group from Western Seminary. And it was heartening to see the deep faith of the Jewish people and walk the paths that Jesus trod. Prayers tucked into the cracks in the wailing wall. This is the western wall of the temple, the only wall that still stands since it was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. But people continue to write down their prayers and tuck them into this wall. And this speaks of the history and hope held in this space. Persistent prayer, relentless resistance. And yet, and yet driving along the main road, one of the only roads throughout the West Bank, and coming upon this 30-foot wall within another three feet of barbed razor wire built to divide people one from another, it was jarring. It was unsettling. It literally stopped our bus in its tracks. There's no way to pass through that wall. And seeing Bethlehem, Bethlehem, walled in, walled in where li residents literally can't get out except through an armed checkpoint. A checkpoint at which our seminary leader and a local missionary who was our guide were held at gunpoint for over an hour while we students waited with fear and trembling. That was distressing too. It's a land full of turmoil. But there is hope too, and I saw that. I saw hope in a Palestinian Christian family who welcomed me and a classmate into their home to stay for a few days and a few nights. This is this wonderful family. We experienced Middle Eastern hospitality at its best. It was truly hospitality of heart and home, a people who have so little, so little, offered so very much to us over those few days. The, the father here was an amazing carpenter, but he didn't have a work permit. They're really tough to come by to leave the small town of Beit Zahur, which is just a couple miles outside of Bethlehem where they lived. And work was in the city. Work is in Jerusalem, a city just six miles away. But he couldn't get through the checkpoint and around the wall to seek that work. And so when we brought this family some bread, I mean just a simple loaf of bread that we bought for a dollar or two in Jerusalem as a thank you for hosting us, they were ecstatic. They were simply overjoyed. It's from Jerusalem, they cried, with deep gratitude. You see, they can't travel to Jerusalem six miles away, a holy city a city that's holy to we Christians, and yet so far out of reach for this Palestinian Christian family. Now, I'm quite certain that this family put their hope in the Lord, and they prayed persistently for changes in their land, for justice in their land. They shared generously with us what little they had. <clears throat> And family was literally at the center of their lives. This is a cross um, carved by the father in that picture. It was beautiful. And the woodwork in their home was just all hand carved by him. And yet he couldn't get work. 
They visited, the, the mom and dad, there. they visited both their sets of parents every night. That's how important family was to them. And I remember a meal that we had with them one night where there were three eggs, source of protein, three eggs to share amongst the whole extended family. And there were two plates. And both Miriam and I were each given our own egg on our own plate. It was astonishing, and I have to say a little bit awkward. We didn't quite know what to do as the rest of the family shared one egg and some bread and vegetables from the garden, eating it all from the surface of the small table in their home. But we did because that's what you do with Middle Eastern hospitality. You receive it with grace and with gratitude. And because in the West Bank, heat is a luxury and hard to come by, and we were there in January, we slept with three layers of clothing, a couple of pair of long underwear, blue jeans, a coat, a hat, mittens. And although I'm from Michigan and I am very used to the cold, I would dare say that those few nights I slept in the West Bank were the coldest I have ever experienced. You see, Israel controls the utilities, and they can and do cut them off. Now, just because I've been to this region, and I know that some of you have too, and some have lived there, like Meryl, who's going to lead our adult ed today, I certainly can't pretend to understand all of the many, many layers of history and hatred between these people groups. But I do know that land is at the core of it. And I also know that there are groups of, of Israelis and Palestinians, regular citizens like you and me, who have been working, striving, yearning for peace for years. There are groups of mothers, mothers who have lost their sons at war, all these wars since World War II. Jewish sons and Muslim sons and Christian sons, Israeli sons and Palestinian sons. And these women have come together to work for peace, to resist the unjust policies and the terrorism, to protest the taking of land and building of walls and shutting off of power and water and fuel, as has happened in recent days. They've come together, connected over their grief, their communal grief, to strive towards a more just solution and to work for peace in this very troubled region of our world. It has not been easy for these women. It never is. And yet they remind me and they reminded me this week of the widow in Jesus' parable, filled with fear and frustration, crying out to God, How long, O oh Lord? Persistent prayer in the face of seeming silence and ongoing war, relentless resistance to systems and structures of injustice and oppression, and trust a deep, deep trust in God's promises and in God's presence with them, even in the valley of the shadow of death. Far, far too much death. Toward the end of this oratorio to be certain of the dawn comes a mournful chant a chant marking the progression of prejudice, which then led, as we all know, to the demise of a whole people. It consists of disturbing words interspersed hauntingly with beautiful, lyrical music. And this represented hope, a stubborn hope. Hope that God will indeed hear our prayers, 
that God wept as they wept and that God continues to weep as we weep. That God's will and Christ's peace will indeed somehow prevail. Friends, that is our hope too. As the symphony drew to a close, the youth chorus in which my daughter sang these sweet, melodic, innocent voices, they captured the very essence of this hope, singing, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. It was powerful. It was poignant. And it was a needed reminder of the deep truth that God's steadfast love endures forever. And so, my friends, for such a time as this, we too are called to persistent prayer and relentless resistance to all forms of injustice. We are called to be a voice for the voiceless, to speak out on behalf of oppressed peoples everywhere. We are called to pray, to pray. Prayer as lament, prayer as protest, prayer with supplication and petition, prayer as a crying out to God in all sorts of circumstances, trusting in God's presence and in God's power. Yes, the call of all believers, the whole life of all of us who profess to follow Jesus the Christ, the Prince of Peace, ought to be characterized by the profound and transforming power of prayer. About this particular parable, one commentator, a German theologian, he writes this, prayer and crying out to God against injustice suffered describes the whole life of believers, their efforts, their protest against injustice, and their trust in God, for they know that God is altogether different from this unjust judge. God is a God of compassion for all people, the persecuted, the oppressed, and yes, even the oppressor. May we rend our hearts and lift our prayers on behalf of our fellow humankind suffering in the Middle East, in Ukraine, on the continent of Africa, and all around the world. Amen.